On June 19, 1953, married couple Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, who were convicted of conspiring to pass U.S. atomic secrets to the Soviet Union, were executed at Sing Sing Prison in New York. Both refused to admit any wrongdoing and proclaimed their innocence right up to the time of their deaths by the electric chair. The Rosenbergs were the first U.S. citizens to be convicted and executed for espionage during peacetime, and their case remains controversial to this day. So were they innocent scapegoats for overzealous red scaremongers and rabid anti-Semites? Or were they not only avowed communists, but indeed Soviet spies that crucially aided the Ruskies in developing their own A-bomb, thus emboldening their militaristic expansion policies in critical post-war years when America would have otherwise had unchallenged militaristic supremacy? I already hear you asking, who cares? Well, because academia in the U.S. is full of communist sympathizers to this day who either have just been regurgitating the same tripe American and European communists who were arguing in the 50s when you could have somewhat credibly made the argument that they didn't know any better because the full knowledge of just how evil and murderous life actually was in the Soviet Union. Or we have modern scholars who have willfully ignored crystal clear evidence that came to light in the decades since the declassified, decoded Soviet messages showing that Julius Rosenberg was indeed a spy for the Kremlin. Even in the movie You've Got Mail, the Greg Kinnear character is gushingly referred to by the New York liberal intelligentsia starfucker character played by Parker Posey as, quote, This man is the greatest living expert on Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. You know what always fascinated me about Julius and Ethel Rosenberg is how old they looked when they were really just our age. <laughs> Dr. Gerhard Falk is the author of 19 books and over 40 journal articles. He's the professor of sociology at Buffalo State College, where he teaches criminology, sociology of religion, juvenile delinquency, and the treatment of offenders. Here's what he had to say about the Rosenbergs. The killings were organized by J. Edgar Hoover, director of the FBI, and well known for his Jew baiting and approved by then-President Dwight Eisenhower, without a doubt a bigot of extraordinary malevolence. In the effort to slaughter two innocent Jews as a warning to all other Jews, the hate mongers were greatly assisted by two Jews, i.e. the prosecutor, Irving Saypole, and the judge, Irving Kaufman. Kaufman reminds us of the, quote, kapos, or Jewish concentration camp police, who imagined that they could save themselves by sending other Jews to their deaths. Let it be understood that the Rosenbergs had done nothing whatever that could possibly be regarded as a crime. They were the innocent victims of an anti-Jewish conspiracy. Every word of what you just said was wrong. Wrong. Ah! Wrong! Julius and Ethel were both first-generation Americans born in New York to parents who had fled persecution and pogroms in the Russian Empire. Julius Rosenberg joined the Army Signal Corps' engineering laboratories in Fort Monmouth, New Jersey in 1940, but was fired in 1945 after it was discovered that he had previously been a member of the Communist Party. Julius was recruited as a spy for the Soviets on Labor Day 1942 by Russian spymaster Semyon Semyonov, who was introduced to Julius by Bernard Schuster, a high-ranking member of the Communist Party USA. Rosenberg provided thousands of classified reports from Emerson Radio Company, where he worked after he was fired from the Army Signal Corps. One important series of classified documents pertained to the instructions for proximity fuses, which is a technology enabling automatic detonation of bombs once they reach a certain proximity to the target. Julius also recruited several spies for the cause, including Manhattan Project engineer Russell McNutt. McNutt's employment at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory provided access to secrets about processes for manufacturing weapons-grade uranium. Julius also recruited his wife Ethel's own brother, David Greenglass, who was working as a machinist on the Manhattan Project in Los Alamos National Laboratory. On August 29, 1949, the Soviets exploded their first atomic bomb at a remote test site in Kazakhstan, shocking the U.S. with the speed at which their own scientists could develop a nuclear bomb. Top U.S. officials determined that there was simply no way a country as ravaged in terms of economy and manufacturing by the Second World War and so far behind the U.S. technologically could have possibly accomplished this feat so quickly without having stolen the know-how. And it turns out they were in fact correct about that assumption. And thus, officially began not only the nuclear arms race, but the Red Terror on U.S. soil as the government tried, arrested, turned, or even killed every communist spy they could find. 
Briefly, I'm going to give you the history on how Julius and Ethel were discovered. In January 1950, the U.S. discovered that Klaus Fuchs, a German refugee theoretical physicist working for the British division of the Manhattan Project, had given key documents to the Soviets throughout the war. Fuchs identified his courier as American Harry Gold, who was arrested on May 23, 1950. Gold confessed and identified David Greenglass as an additional source. On June 15, 1950, David Greenglass was arrested by the FBI for espionage and soon confessed to having passed secret information onto the USSR through gold, and he also claimed that his sister Ethel's husband, Julius Rosenberg, had convinced David's wife, Ruth, to recruit him while visiting him in Albuquerque, New Mexico in 1944. A top-secret U.S. counterintelligence program named the Venona Project had been run by the United States Army Signal Intelligence Corps since the Second World War. Its purpose was to decrypt any and all foreign coded messages. On December 20, 1946, a young woman named Meredith Gardner made the first break into the Russian code, which eventually led to cracking all of the NKVD and GRU, General Staff of the Armed Forces of the Russian Federation, communications. I won't hold my breath for Hollywood to make a pro-women in STEM fields movie about Meredith Gardner, though. Hell, they're more likely to make a movie where Ethel Rosenberg's the heroine. These intercepted and decoded messages revealed that numerous spies were entrenched in the U.S. government and had stolen military technology secrets, including those from the Manhattan Project. Each spy was given a code name by the KGB. One such code name was the word liberal. And in one decrypted message, Liberal's wife's actual non-code name was noted as being Ethel. The Rosenbergs were arrested and tried for conspiracy to commit espionage. They presented zero evidence in their own defense, but pled innocent to all charges and pled the Fifth Amendment right to not self-incriminate for every question posed to them. So now here's the rub. Let's say you're the U.S. government with access to the Venona program decryptions, but you don't want the Soviet Union to know that you've broken their codes. And you've caught the Rosenbergs, but there's only circumstantial, non-Venona evidence against Ethel. What do you do? Per a 1999 Yale University Press article, quote, The government did not release the Venona decryptions to the public, and it successfully disguised the source of its information about Soviet espionage. This decision, to not release Venona decryptions, denied the public the incontestable evidence afforded by the messages of the Soviet Union's own spies. Since the information about Soviet espionage and the American Communist participation derived largely from the testimony of defectors and a mass of circumstantial evidence, the public's belief in those reports rested on faith in the integrity of government security officials. These sources are inherently more ambiguous than the hard evidence of the Venona messages, and this ambiguity had unfortunate consequences for American politics and Americans' understanding of their own history. The Venona messages, however, do not throw Ethel's guilt in doubt. Indeed, they confirm that she was a participant in her husband's espionage and in the recruitment of her brother for atomic espionage. Judge Kaufman, incidentally a Jewish American as well, sentenced the Rosenbergs to death thusly. Citizens of this country who betray their fellow countrymen can be under none of the delusions about the benignity of Soviet power that they might have been prior to World War II. The nature of Russian terrorism is now self-evident. Idealism as a rationale dissolves. I consider your crime worse than murder. Plain, deliberate, contemplated murder is dwarfed in magnitude by comparison with the crime you have committed. In committing the act of murder, the criminal kills only his victim. The immediate family is brought to grief, and when justice is meted out, the chapter is closed. But in your case, I believe your conduct in putting into the hands of the Russians the A-bomb, years before our best scientists predicted Russia would perfect the bomb, has already caused, in my opinion, the communist aggression in Korea, with the resultant casualties exceeding 50,000. And who knows but that millions more of innocent people may pay the price of your treason. Indeed, by your betrayal, you undoubtedly have altered the course of history to the disadvantage of our country. No one can say that we do not live in a constant state of tension. We have evidence of your treachery all around us every day. For the civilian defense activities throughout the nation are aimed at preparing us for an atom bomb attack. Nor can it be said in mitigation of the offense that the power which set the conspiracy in motion and profited from it was not openly hostile to the United States at the time of the conspiracy. 
If this was your excuse, the error of your ways in setting yourself above the properly constituted authorities and the decision of those authorities not to share the information with Russia must now be obvious. In the light of this, I can only conclude that the defendants entered into the most serious conspiracy against their country with full realization of its implications. The statute of which the defendants at the bar stand convicted is clear. I have previously stated my view that the verdict of guilty was amply justified by the evidence. In the light of the circumstances, I feel that I must pass such sentence upon the principles in this diabolical conspiracy to destroy a God-fearing nation, which will demonstrate with finality that this nation's security must remain inviolate. That traffic in military secrets, whether promoted by slavish devotion to a foreign ideology or by a desire for monetary gains, must cease. The evidence indicated quite clearly that Julius Rosenberg was the prime mover in this conspiracy. However, let no mistake be made about the role which his wife, Ethel Rosenberg, played in its conspiracy. Instead of deterring him from pursuing his ignoble cause, she encouraged and assisted the cause. She was a mature woman almost three years older than her husband and almost seven years older than her younger brother. She was a full-fledged partner in this crime. Indeed, the defendants Julius and Ethel Rosenberg placed their devotion to their cause above their own personal safety and were conscious that they were sacrificing their own children, should their misdeeds be detected. All of which did not deter them from pursuing their course. Love for their cause dominated their lives, and it was even greater than their love for their own children. After the Rosenbergs were put to death, the French philosopher and author Jean-Paul Sartre wrote in June 1953 that it was a legal lynching which smears with blood a whole nation. By killing Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, you have quite simply tried to halt the progress of science by human sacrifice. Magic, witch hunts, sacrifices. We are here getting to the point. Your country is sick with fear. You are afraid of the shadow of your own bomb. As for the Rosenberg's two children they left behind, sons Michael and Robert Rosenberg, left without parents, they were adopted by Abel and Anne Mirapol, card-carrying communists both. The young boys, three and seven years old respectively, eventually took their last name, Mirapol, legally. For decades, their sons participated in leftist activism and maintained their parents' innocence until 2008, when they admitted their father was definitely a confirmed spy, and then a 60 Minutes interview in 2016, when they finally admitted both their parents were. Both of the brothers became university professors. I know, big surprise, right? Now, look, I get it. Mistakes were definitely made by anti-communists in the government looking for spies and propagandists during this period. And there has absolutely been vile anti-Semitism by powerful figures in the U.S. at times. But briefly reflect that the USSR was allied to Nazi Germany during several of the early years that Julius ran his spy ring. So claiming that he was just an avowed anti-fascist is questionable at best. And lest we forget that both his and Ethel's parents fled Soviet states because of anti-Semitic pogroms, which continued well into the 1950s. They were the only spies captured who were executed, but they weren't the only captured Jewish spies. And lastly, don't forget that in the 20th century after Nazi Germany, the largest number of Jews killed en masse was under the Soviet regime. So the incessant charges of anti-Semitism by quote-unquote historians as being the actual causes of their persecution by the U.S. government aren't merely wrong, they're inverted. So what's the takeaway for future husband and wife traitor cells traitor! where we don't exactly know how involved the wife was? This question reminds me of the interrogation scene in the movie Patriot's Day about the 2013 Boston bombers. Are there more bombs? More bombers? Did you see the footage on television? We found explosive residue from the bombs in your apartment, on your kitchen table, in your kitchen sink, the kitchen where you made breakfast for your daughter. Are there more bombs? Excuse me. What do you think? I think she knew. But you're never going to prove it. If there are more bombs out there, she'll never tell us. How could a mother do that to a daughter? Good luck, huh? Just to be clear, Tamerlan Tsarnaev's wife, Catherine Russell, who you just watched portrayed in the movie, before the bombings, searched on the internet for the terms wife of Mujahideen 
and what are the rewards for wives of Mujahideen, according to testimony in the bomber trial. She also exchanged text with her best friend shortly after the carnage at the finish line of the marathon, writing, quote, a lot more people are killed every day in Syria and other places, innocent people, unquote. So I, for one, don't believe for a fraction of a second that this bitch didn't know exactly what her husband and brother-in-law were up to. But the FBI let her go. I would personally bet that that decision had a lot more to do with the optics than the evidence, circumstantial or otherwise, the FBI might have had. And she's still walking around free as a bird. So I'm a little loath to let law enforcement then as now be painted as jackbooted racist thugs with hard-ons for the suspect foreign minority group of the moment, when from where I'm sitting, their punishments are downright anemic compared to their crimes. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men. <laughs> the Shadow knows. Hi guys, Media Shadow here. I'm trying to grow the channel and get videos out to you just as often as possible. What would really help me accomplish that would be to grow my subscriber numbers. So if you haven't yet and you're digging my content, please hit the subscribe button and that little bell icon to get notified for when all of my videos drop. And if you have already subscribed, please drop a comment, hit the like button, and most importantly, share a video you enjoyed on social media or any dark crevice of the internet you fancy. Thanks! Uh, uh.